Hi, I'm Bob Knoot, and on this episode of the Camp Chaos Chronicles, we're going to take a look at this engine block and determine whether it's usable or whether it's just another coffee table. Dang it. Now the next few episodes, you're gonna notice some things like the facial hair and the seasonal clothing will change from clip to clip. And that's because last fall I shot a lot of footage, but then got really busy and I just didn't have an opportunity to finish up and publish the videos. So you're gonna to have to kind of put up with that. But in this one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this engine block and uh, determine whether it's usable for a project I've got going, actually a project I've had going for a couple of years, the $100 Jaguar V12 overhaul challenge engine, which kind of took a really bad turn a couple of years ago in season one. We're gonna take the internals and we're going to put it in this block right here because I've already used that block for something else. So you'll see what that looks like in an upcoming video probably this summer. Let's get started. The first thing you need to do before you start an inspection is to get the block clean. For a couple of reasons. First of all, you need to be able to see what you're looking at. And secondly, you don't want dirt and debris to interfere with the measurements that you're taking. So whether you're gonna use this block or not, you gotta get it clean like you're going to use it because dirt can be a real issue here. So uh, beyond that, now this block has had a pretty good preliminary clean done on it, uh, both top and bottom. This is a really important thing down here because there's gonna be some precision measurement done here that really, really precludes having any kind of dirt in this vicinity. So you really have to go to the trouble of making this happen because you don't want to discard a block that's actually usable simply because you had some dirt in between the the main bearing caps and the block or maybe in between your measuring device and the part that you're measuring so it's really important we can start out with the simple stuff and the first thing i would do is right here you want to inspect these freeze plugs now, I have never actually seen a freeze plug on a JAG B12 block that actually needed to be replaced. They're clean, they're rust free. There's absolutely no sign that these are a problem or are ever going to be one. So I've been told a number of times by mechanics whose opinion I respect, if you got an aluminum block and there's steel frost plugs or core plugs installed in them, if they're not showing any problems, leave them alone because you can knock them out and then put the next one in and uh, you could actually end up with a leak. That's not at all uncommon. Another simple thing you can do, <clears throat> again, this is after you get the block clean, is you need to inspect these bearings. Now this is another thing that I've never really seen a lot of problems with. You check the finish, these I don't know if you can see this, but they're very smooth. And um, you measure that, and I found that it's well within spec. So these, I mean, there's, you could actually knock these out and replace them. It takes special tools, which I have, I've made them, to knock these things out and put the new ones in. But, you know, they're just not a problem ordinarily. But still, you gotta take a look. You always have to take a look. The other thing is these studs. Now, you can see that on some of these, there's some pitting on them and staining, and you know, these just aren't that bad. These things are incredibly tough, and they're incredibly hard to get out. They are available, and if they're, they are reduced in diameter uh, to any degree, or pitted to any degree, they really should be replaced. Now the hard stuff begins. And it's not that hard, it just needs to be done. 
making sure that these things are all round. And by these things, I mean the bores for the bearings. It's gonna take a little work and it takes some tools. The first step in doing this is to, well, number one, as I said earlier, get these things really, really clean. Everything, the nuts, the, uh, the caps, the block, you can't have anything in between this cap and this block, otherwise it's gonna give you a bad reading. So you need to make sure that all of these things are clean, there's nothing present that's gonna mess up your measurements. The next thing you do is you put them in their proper place. Now remember, all of these things were put in place and torqued down at the factory, and then these holes were all bored with a tool, a boring tool or a honing tool, that made sure that they were all in a perfect line from front to rear. If you get any of these caps mixed up, that's gonna be a problem uh, because the cap will be offset slightly from the, from the mating or its corresponding surface in the block and what that's gonna do is close down your, um, your clearances. And what I do is I number these one through seven. Now, those of you that have been inside of a block on a V12 before will know that the one in front and the one in the rear and the one in the middle are different. You can't mistake them for anything else. And also the bolt holes for, or the stud holes are offset a little bit, so these can only go in one way. These two here and these two back here are identical, except they were in different, different positions when the, when the bores were honed. So they are actually stamped one, two, three, four, so you can know what position that they were in. I number one through seven for the sake of measurement. You know, it just makes sense to do that to me at any rate. So once you got them installed, what you do then is you torque them down in place. When you do that, make sure that you oil the threads and also the washers underneath so that some of your torque is not consumed, overcoming the friction between the stud and the nut and the nut and the washer. Because just a few foot-pounds of torque difference will affect your measurement here at the cap. So. We got our block clean, we got the caps installed where they're supposed to be, they're torqued down to what, they, uh, what the manufacturer recommends, we're ready to start taking measurements. But what are the tools that we're gonna use in order to do that? I mean, you can't eyeball this stuff. Well, there's a couple ways of doing this. First of all, both ways are gonna require the use of a micrometer. And a micrometer is a tool that you can use to measure things to within, in this case, one ten thousandths of an inch. That's pretty fine. A human hair is two thousandths, so there's ten, ten thousandths to a thousandth of an inch, so that's, that's kind of pretty fine. The other tool that you would use in the first method is this tool. This is a telescoping gauge, and this actually has a couple of little pistons here which you can compress when you put them in a bore, and then you would take this end and tighten it so that what you have here should be the same as what you're measuring in the block. I hate this thing. It takes a certain feel in order to, to get this right because as if you don't get it in straight, it's gonna be bigger, smaller, bigger. Uh, it's, if I haven't used these for a while, it takes me a couple hours to get my telescope and gauge mojo back to the point where I can actually take decent measurements. The other way of doing it is with a bore gauge. And what this is, is a dial indicator, graduated in half thousandths or .0005 of an inch, and a long tube that has a shaft or a plunger in it. And then this is the, this is an to this telescoping gauge right here, although it only has one movable side. And it has a fairly narrow range. I forget what it is, a couple hundred thousandths maybe. But this end right here is removable and you can replace it with, with uh, pieces of different length for different diameter holes. This is what we need between 3 inches and 3.2 inches, I believe. And the first thing you got to do is you got to set this thing up. And the way you do that is you first take our micrometer and you set it up to the dimension that the uh, specifications table in the shop manual says that that bore diameter is supposed to be. In this case, we're setting it to the minimum because there is a range that it can be within. 
And so we set that up. And what you do then is you put your gate, your the measuring end in between the, the two. And then you note what it says on the gauge. And you can adjust this dial so that it zeroes when, for example, if we've got if that's what we're seeing when we've got the tool in, in the micrometer, what we could do then is loosen this gauge. And then just turn the dial so that it's zeroed perfectly and then tighten it. Now you need to remember that when this thing reads zero, it indicates that what we're measuring is the minimum diameter of what that bore should be. In this case, it's 3.1665. Any deviation from that is going to be noted on the needle's position relative to that zero. And we need to remember that the tolerance or the range that that measurement can be is two ten thousandths of an inch. So that's going to be less than one of these graduations, which is five ten thousandths of an inch. So if we put it inside the block here, and I'm going to do it at an angle, because really we want to take two measurements, one vertically and one horizontally to determine whether it's round or not. So I'm going to do it this way, kind of at an angle to what I really want, just to show you what I'm doing. We compress that movable side. We put the, the little probe in place here, and we move it around until we get it to nest at the get it to stop moving one way and start moving the other. So we got there at zero. Now remember, that's not vertical. I'm just showing you how this works. If we go this way, <clears throat> we actually see that we are about, we're about five ten thousandths bigger or bigger than the minimum, which means that we are three ten thousandths of an inch bigger this way than we're supposed to be. Okay, maybe that's not a big deal for some builders, but you know, we'd like to see these things perfectly round. Now, let's take a measurement this way. We need to remember that we've got all sorts of little divots right here that uh, we can actually get one or the other end of our tool in and uh, make it impossible to measure properly. So we'll find a spot here where there's nothing that is going to mess us up. Also remember we've got a joint between the cap and the block here. Keep the probes out of that. And if we, I don't know if you can see this, but it's right on zero. So what this is telling us is that this dimension right here is about a half a thousandth of an inch bigger in this dimension than in this dimension, which puts it three ten thousandths out of spec. Okay, not awful, but this is as good as it gets right here in these blocks. As we go toward the back, it's probably going to be much worse. So let's take a look at and see what we're doing here. Now what we're going to do now is we're going to take and we're going to remove this cap and measure the other one. We could actually measure these two right here without taking the caps off, but we're going to pull them off anyway, and it just makes it much easier to maneuver the tool around inside here if you got these caps out of the way. So this bore is exactly the same as this one right here. It's 3.1665 this way, which is the minimum that you'd like to see. That's good. But it's 3.167 this way. So it's, um, it's a bit bigger than we'd like to see it uh, in horizontal. But, you know, it's still within a thousandth of an inch out of round, which is not a great thing, but... If they were that way from front to back, I would be inclined to reuse it using a technique that, uh, that I will disclose later. Okay, now this is where things are starting to go pear-shaped, literally. Not only is our dimension increased vertically to 3.1672, I believe it is, this has begun to get pulled in like this so that this dimension, which should be 3.1665, is now 3.1655. So this is actually pulled in a thousandth of an inch smaller than what we'd like to see. Now, that's unusual 
in that for that to start happening so much toward the front of the engine is odd. I'm thinking from here on back, things are going to get out of hand. So let's see what happens. Bearing number four, uh, this is where you would normally see some of these anomalies begin to happen. Actually, it's virtually identical to number three. So let's keep going and see what happens. Well, as I said, things typically get worse as we get toward the back of the engine, and they did a little bit. Six, five and six uh, were a little bit worse vertically, but horizontally not too bad. And we could have actually handled that using an old school technique, but we got here to the last one, and up here in front of this oil gallery, it wasn't too bad, but then back here, it suddenly opened up to 10 thousandths of an inch toward the back. 10 thousandths of an inch different this way than this way. And that was weird enough that I took it off the stand so I could take a little better look. And if you look right here, you can see that there's a ledge. There's an edge right here. There's a step from here to here. This, the outer part of it right here, is just about in spec. Right here, I mean, it's, it's just a... It's about it's a ten thousandth of an inch step from here to here. And it doesn't look like the bearing is spun because the surface is smooth. It's just that this has been hammered so badly. The steel, the cast iron, you can feel a little bit, not too bad, but you know, maybe a thousandth or two, but right here, this is where it all is. And the thing is with this car that there's a lot of things about it that indicated that it had been abused pretty badly. If you looked at the tires, uh, the main exhaust mufflers had been removed and uh, the transmission fluid that was in it and the condition of the differential unit uh, when we pulled it out to, before we scrapped the car, um, it was real obvious that this car had been driven really, really hard. It had been bought cheap and beat up pretty badly. Well, the decision has been made, this block is not suitable for rebuilding. The problem being that all the bores for the main bearings have been knocked out of spec. So uh, we could actually have an operation called a line honing done to this, where a little material is removed from the block and from the cap, it's torqued together and then a hone restores it back to its original size for between six and eight hundred dollars if you're made out of money. But as it stands right now, I've got a few spares, so I'm gonna sort through the stack and come up with a decent block. This block, I could do the ubiquitous coffee table conversion with it, but I'm afraid it would clash with my 1970s sheet interior design solutions. So if you like these videos, like, subscribe, follow us on Facebook, and I really do plan on getting around to get that up running next week. And maybe leave a comment down below so that we can know what we can do to do what we do better. So we'll see you the next time on the Camp Chaos Chronicles.